Hey, y'all, just so you know, we're going to be talking about this week's episodes of In Treatment. So spoilers are ahead. We also wanted to let you know that we'll be having conversations about trauma and corporal punishment. There's also some explicit language in this podcast. So please take care of yourself while listening. My name is Brandon Kyle Goodman. My pronouns are he and they, and I am a writer, I'm an actor, and I'm an activist, and I'm also a proud Black queer person. And I am Dr. Janelle S. Pfeiffer. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and academic, and I am also a mom. And welcome to In Session, which is the official companion podcast of the HBO show In Treatment, where we're going to deconstruct what happens on the show to understand how therapy works. Just as a reminder, this is not a substitute for therapy. So if you feel like you would want to talk to somebody, please reach out to a mental health professional. Let's get started. Honesty is all you can offer another person. If you give them honesty and they don't respond in kind, that's on them. So we are with Dr. Brooke in her third session with her three main clients. So we're still seeing the maternal transference happening between her and Eladio. We get a little deeper into Colin and his marriage, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then also we see Brooke spiraling in her addiction. Mm -hmm. But what really stuck out to me this week was Layla's session. Oh, yes. Layla's session really hit home. And there's so much there related to spanking and culture and mental freedom as an idea. Mm. I think we could spend the whole session just talking about Layla. I think that's a really good idea because I know that this session really brought up a lot for us. Can we actually make a disclaimer here? I want to give us permission to like fumble as we talk about this. Mm -hmm. As we're talking, I find myself on the verge of tears as we unpack this. Me too. So I just want to give us permission and space to fumble and say some things that may be triggering to our listeners. And so also listeners, please take care of yourself as we unpack this thing that is Mm -hmm. so deeply rooted in Black culture and so deeply rooted in our childhood. Mm -hmm. But we're going to do our best to untangle some of it and have some takeaways. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So why don't we start by talking about Layla's exchange with Brooke about being punished while she was growing up. Anyways, my grandma found me and dragged me and my suitcase all the way back home. (laughs) And yeah, you know what happens to a black girl when she doesn't act right? What happens to a black girl when she doesn't act right? Dr. Taylor, are you serious? I mean, I know your family is bougie, but, like, y'all are still black, right? What happens, Layla? You have to pick the belt. Was corporal punishment a fixture in your childhood? Jeez, corporal punishment? That's like... What's the name of that prison in Iraq? How would you describe it? (laughs) I mean, not like that. You were never spanked when you were a kid. Black kids get beat. It's not a big deal. The assumption that black people need to be punished physically is frustrating for me. Mm. We're both like, (laughs) we're both sitting here like, "Mm -hmm." Mm -hmm. this was a really triggering scene for me, specifically because I'm from the Caribbean. And so culturally, there is a history of spanking inside of especially the Caribbean black culture. We're not a monolith, so, oh, you, but you know what I mean. And I'll say, I'll pause and say, I think this is much broader. It happens in parents in general and in the wider diaspora, for sure. Yes. And so I definitely grew up being spanked for a certain period of time until my mother actually put a stop to it. I think when I was like seven, maybe, or something like that, my mother was like, no more. And I didn't understand why. Uh, And I understand why now, especially watching Layla, because there is Mm -hmm. a thing that black children have to deal with, which is that the world treats them as adults, right? We know the adultification of black girls specifically happens, Mm -hmm. I believe, like at six or seven. And for black boys, I think it's like 10 or 11. We know that we're seen as less innocent. We're perceived as less, just less. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so this idea that the world 
and white society is already abusive to black children. And that spanking of black children from their black parents is also abuse. Mm-hmm. I'm using the word abuse on spanking. And I know that there will be people who are like, it's not abuse, but it is. I never grew up thinking of spanking as abuse because it's not punching somebody in the face, right? Mm-hmm. You're taught like, well, you get spanked on your bottom or whatever, and that's normal. But you're like, well, what's the difference? Mm-hmm. If a child can't protect themselves, if they can't fight back and they're being hit, whether it's with a belt or a closed fist or an open fist, it's still harm. Mm-hmm. That's what never gets unpacked. Mm-hmm. Those things are looked at as separate and they're very much the same. This is hard to talk about. Yes. So let's start off this quote that hit me right at the center of my chest when Dr. Brooks said, the idea that Black children need to be punished is frustrating to me. Mm. And frustrating felt like the understatement of the century. Right? <laughs> yes. Like this clearly was much more than frustrating for her. And I think if we engage with what you just said, this idea of the healthy intention underneath the behavior of spanking Mm -hmm. being this desire to protect and preemptively harden your children to be able to face the difficulties of the world that have historically and presently and for the foreseeable future, if we're getting real, has put their innocence in a space that they can't access. Like Black children... Innocence is uh, gone in a blink of an eye, Mm -hmm. right? Their childhood is so short and fragile. So you see when you're in this position as a parent and for me as a mother where you look at your child and I have to pull myself mindfully into the present moment when my son is acting out because I know there is no grace for him. Mm -hmm. And I have to look at him with my eyes, seeing him as a five-year-old and not as a 15-year-old. I have even had to pull the words back into my mouth of, you can't mess up. And he can't understand this. He's a child. You know, his frontal lobe is nowhere near developed, right? Yeah. But that that feeling of protection that I am trying to prepare you for a world that is going to not give you any grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not going to give you a second chance. Mm Mm-mm. And I guess to my thing about the spanking being abuse, this is what makes it complicated. Because when we think about abuse, we think about anger and hatred and fuck you. Whereas I do believe that some of spanking, especially for parents, is out of fear and out of love. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, I'm not saying it makes it right, but mm-hmm. when you leave my house, I cannot protect you. And so I need you to know how to fall in line. Mm-hmm. And the quickest way I know how to do that is to spank you. I think is a lot of the thinking behind it, right? Oh, yes. I love how you said that because we're starting to think about the thinking and not the excuses, right? We're not justifying, but part of what we're identifying, and I can imagine doing this therapeutically, is then what tools do you need to fulfill that healthy intention in a way that is going to be positive? I even remember growing up, and I think that Layla alludes to this as well, you would hear white parents talking to their children and kind of explaining and justifying and bargaining. And, you know, your black mom would be like, no, (laughs) this is is not. But the idea that behind it, we know that it's important to be able to slow down to help a child to explain their behavior in context. Yeah. We know it's important to have other tools in your parenting toolkit Mm -hmm. that you understand how to reduce the behaviors that are worrisome for you, the things that have you scared. There are ways to engage with that fear and do the work as well as a parent to go through some of your own trauma and some of the internalized white supremacy that is seeping into your household, right? Yes, because what did fucking slave masters used to do Mm -hmm. to keep black people in line? They used to whip us. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? It is the the same tool, the same oppressive tool that we as a culture have adopted did to keep our kids in line mm-hmm. because we know what happens in the same way that when a slave quote unquote misbehaved what happened right mm-hmm. it's not different 
right? If we're looking at our news and our headlines, Mm -hmm. when we're recording this, it's the day after a year since uh, George Floyd was murdered, right? And so again, like an actual representation about what happens when a white person thinks that you as a black person in a black body is quote unquote misbehaving. Mm -hmm. And I think what was so triggering at this international level, but at this deep internal level for so many of us black folks was that it feels like the margin for error is so small and it could be anything yes. at any point. And part of what I want to make sure that I bring to the foreground is I think that these conversations are already shifting mm. intergenerationally. Sure, We are identifying these historic influences and this history that has informed some of the cultural practices that came from the place of survival. Mm -hmm. And we're claiming new ways of engaging with our children, with ourselves, that can help us try to thread the needle of preparing your child to engage with the complexity of this world, but also not neglecting the need for freedom, for joy, for a child. For innocence. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, Layla says, you know, the stakes are too high Mm -hmm. to not be quiet. (laughs) You know, this idea that the misbehavior is is speaking out. Mm -hmm. Like, if you speak up and you speak out, you are misbehaving and that can literally get you killed. That's, I think, what makes this conversation so hard. And again, the separation between when we say abuse and we say spanking and, and and I'm saying that they're the same, it's hard because you're like... Yeah, the stakes are high. (laughs) And so some parents go by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure my kid stays in line and knows how to act. Mm -hmm. And then for the point of this podcast, which we brought up, you know, the first episode, it's like for us in our culture, who has time to worry about this therapeutically? Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. You know, depending on what my circumstances are, where I live, my finances, you know, how many kids I have, if I'm a single mother or single father, all these things were like, how much time do I have to sit down and ask my kid about his emotions? Right. Mm -hmm. We're not taught to value that. And so then spanking becomes just the like, that's what I have time for. I can spank. Thank you and put you in line. Again, not making excuses for it, but just trying to understand why it has taken so long for generations to begin talking about Mm -hmm. another way. Mm -hmm. I mean, and what blows my mind to an extent, but I also understand at the same time that sort of both and. And I think that as we're having this conversation, we're trying to hold the idea of a dialectical balance Mm. where these two seemingly opposing truths have to exist at the same time. That opposition is where the truth is. Yes. So part of what I notice is that there is still so much controversy and people feel very much so defensive of spanking as a legitimate parenting choice. Yeah. And this is one of those things where there's a lot of things in psychology where the science is still catching up to the complexities of the human mind. But spanking isn't one of those. Like, yeah. from the research, it's clear that spanking is not effective, A, for behavior change. Children who are spanked often have worse behaviors and long-term outcomes. Yeah. Not only mental health, but engagement in the criminal justice system. A lot of the behaviors, it has the sort of opposite reaction that people are looking for. And it leads to a lot of the negative outcomes that they don't want. Yes. So it's that much harder to watch because you see people trying to use a tool that's like, you know, trying to fix a broken bookcase and all you have is this like hammer. Yeah. You're like, no, you need you need some other tools in the toolkit. So I do like to underscore the fact I know that people feel defensive and especially when they look back at their own families and they say you know i turned out all right right that's always it i worked for me and i'm fine Mm -hmm. just because you didn't experience the full negative effect of it necessarily there are still i think underlying things Mm -hmm. that you're probably not aware of that are connected to spanking and being spanked Mm -hmm. and so i would argue some of those things is it's harder for you to find a safe space it's harder for you to possibly trust maybe It's not physically, but verbally, you might be somebody who lashes out in the same way that you were literally lashed. But Mm. those are things that you're not conscious of. You're just like, I turned out okay because, you know, I pay my bills on time. It's like, it's deeper than that, you know? Yes. 
And I feel like this is a phenomenal thing to explore in therapy. Yes. Right? There are specific therapies that are about helping you to learn and be equipped to have the ability to parent aligned with what your values and long-term goals are. Like mm-hmm. there are people that this is their expertise in a warm, non-judgmental way to be a partner in that process. Yes. Because for many of us, how do you know how to parent? Like we learn from our parents. Right. Like right. there's no course. I often joke that I did more preparation to like go to college than I did to bring a human life into the world. It's a little ridiculous. A thousand percent. <laughs> But you know, what you bring up is that, like, our society values being right. And this is cross-culture. Like, there's such a value on being right. And when you're told that you're wrong about something, and I've done this, we take it as a reflection of our worth, Mm -hmm. as opposed to going, you have never been a parent. Why would you know how to be a parent? Yes. Of course you should be researching and talking to your therapist and, and reading this book and da 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 And of course, maybe your parents did it wrong or did some things wrong because nobody taught them how to be a parent, you know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like, But the, the pride, mm-hmm. it, it requires you to put your ego to the side and go, maybe I can do something differently and better. Yeah. I also think that increasingly we don't want our children to just be in line. Mm. We don't want them to be compliant and obedient. We want them to change the systems, and that requires the ability to engage with them fully when their behaviors are something that we don't understand, when their emotions have depth that is sometimes feels scary for us. Mm -hmm. So if we want to change our culture and our society, then part of that is not seeking obedience. Oof. It's really engaging beyond that. Huh. Amen. If I was in church right now, I would be doing the church <laughs> stomps. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I don't deserve to be hit. And I, I wasn't hit, I was spanked. I mean, there's a difference. And when I look at these white kids that go to my school, I know that they wouldn't be acting foolish if their parents had just, I don't know, spanked them a time or two. Those white kids have a mental freedom you will never know, that I will never have. I just want to repeat that last line that Dr. Brooks says, which is those white kids have a mental freedom you will never know and I will never have. Mm-hmm. <sighs> What is mental freedom? And even what what role does therapy play in the process of pursuing mental freedom, right? Mm-hmm. And I would argue freedom, period. And I think at one point freedom looked like the ability for a Black person to purchase a house or to be a CEO or to be a therapist, a doctor. Mm-hmm. But it's deeper than that to me. It's like the ability to move through the world without jumping through a hoop Mm -hmm. every second and not just like a hoop career wise but we're talking about like Mm -hmm. does my hair look okay not because I want to look cute but because I need to signal certain things for my safety Mm -hmm. do you know what I'm saying Mm -hmm. like like that to me is real freedom is being able to just exist and I think to your point about mental freedom it's like maybe therapy can get you to a certain level of mental freedom but what's always sad to me is I don't know if we'll experience true freedom in our lifetime Mm. as black people the fullness the expansiveness Mm. of freedom Mm -hmm. of what those white kids experience as she said Uh, I mean, and what you said brought up for me this image in my mind of the wavelengths that you're operating on while you're moving through space. Mm. The level of having to be aware of and processing and anticipating Mm. and analyzing Mm. and like looking for risk, that hypervigilance. Yes. Right. In so many ways, the opposite of freedom is feeling that in each space you have to have this whole other level of awareness and attunement that it feels like there's nothing that can be done to get away from it. No amount of achievement, no amount of being good enough, no amount of work can give you that release. Mm -hmm. After this episode, Dr. Brooke 
drinks for the first time. And when we start to dig in, then what does alcohol represent? That desire for freedom. Yes. That desire to like release, to just not have to deal with all the mental aerobics. Mm -hmm. And I want to just for like our listeners who are not black, I I like to give this example of freedom. And I have a white partner, a white husband, Mm -hmm. and here's our our freedom. Whenever I walk the dog, I have my wallet and my phone on me. Mm -hmm. And I will not walk my dog later than eight Mm o'clock. My husband will walk the dog and I'll look in his phone and his wallet are in the house mm-hmm. and he's out there with by himself with flip flops at nine o'clock, nine thirty. Mm-hmm. That is that is a freedom that I won't know. Mm-hmm. Right. Like when I'm leaving the house, I am preparing to be pulled over. Mm-hmm. I'm preparing to be uh considered in the wrong neighborhood. I'm preparing for what could happen if The wrong person sees me at the wrong or right time Mm -hmm. and what could happen to my life in that moment. Yes. That is something my white husband does not ever think about. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you as a black woman have even more of that because now you add being a woman on top of that, you know? Yes. I mean, and you have to wonder. I mean, I've wondered, what would I do with that? additional mental bandwidth. Yes. What could I do if I wasn't having to defend why I'm in my faculty office? Right. right? If I didn't have to walk outside of my house and already be going through what sort of Layla described, this thought process of, okay, if I get pulled over, if somebody comes, Mm -hmm. a police officer rolls by, what am I going to say? How am I going to react? What might happen? What would I do with that additional bandwidth? I don't, I can't even imagine, right? Yeah. This episode was where I felt the most raw emotionally after watching it. Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like I've spent my entire life watching black kids get murdered, like... For what? For nothing. For a water gun. For... I mean, black girls getting dragged down the middle of the street for being too loud. Like, the stakes, they're too fucking high for black kids to be anything but quiet. Acting right doesn't make a difference. But I think to their relationship, what I imagine Brooke and Layla could get to... Right, is you may not ever get to that freedom because literally your safety depends on that awareness. Mm -hmm. But what she might be able to get to is feeling of value, Mm -hmm. knowing that regardless of how the world is operating and regardless of the ways in which she has to protect herself and prepare and prep, that hopefully inside of that she can still find value Mm -hmm. because that's what usually happens or that's been my experience and why this episode hit is because of having to do all that, I lost value for myself, right? I thought I was the problem Mm -hmm. and not the white kids, right? I thought I was the problem and not the police officer Mm -hmm. and needing to get to a place where it's like, no, 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 the system is the problem. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and sure, there are things I got to do to my mother would always say, just get home. Right. There are certain things that I have to do to make sure I get home, Mm -hmm. which is even another thing that, you know, I I imagine certain families aren't saying. Mm -hmm. But can I find value for myself? Yes. Can I find value for my experience? Can I find value for my worth inside of that? (sighs) Yes. I believe it's so essential to have these nuanced, full conversations that doesn't only focus on the pain and the restriction and the suffering, but also thinks about the unique strength and resilience and flourishing that accompanies that as well. Mm-hmm. Right? That these are two sides of the coin. And I think we are such a polarized sort of society that we want truths to be clean and they just aren't. Right? Yes. <laughs> right? They aren't. <laughs> they aren't. They are not. So part of what this idea of, like you said, of finding your value in it, and you can see there is something special about her being in the room with a therapist 
who she doesn't have to explain that. Yes. She doesn't have to do any education. Yes. She doesn't have to do any labor. They are resonating at like a heart level. Absolutely. You know, having black, Asian, Latin uh, medical professionals is important mm-hmm. because that identity when you're trying to deal with that is important to not have to explain. Mm-hmm. And it's also why it's so beautiful to see Now she can go deeper. Mm -hmm. She has a shot at finding that value because Dr. Brooke, I think, understands so viscerally the the chains of the system. Yeah, you can imagine that this is just the starting point and that they can really dig into it. Yeah. But it makes sense because that's what black people do. That's what we're for in America. We're set up to fail. Everything is set up that way. So if you're the one in a thousand person that doesn't, then that's fucking great. Doesn't sound like you think success is all that great. My dad's a success. And he's miserable. I'm a success. I got into every single school that I applied to. I was really curious, especially knowing that we were going to have this conversation. I wonder for you, I mean, you clearly have achieved so much. You've worked so hard. You do such cool things. What resonated with you about her talking about that that feeling that, yeah, she got into every school she applied for, (laughs) done all of the things that she was supposed to do? Sure. I wondered what this meant to you. Yeah, I'm going to give you a little context and the listeners a little context. My grandmother moved here from Trinidad. She's the first in the family to move here. And as you can imagine, a black woman from the Caribbean immigrant moving here and then establishing a whole life when she passed away about 10 years ago, she was the Reverend Dr. Virginia Goodman. So she had like mm. gone from like a bus driver mm. to mm-hmm. starting and beginning and running churches. And my mother's also an actress. And I've only known my mother's an actress, which is also a wild thing to like be be able to support your yourself and your child and your family just acting mm-hmm. as a black woman who was acting in the 80s and the 90s and yeah. early 2000s. I like to say this is before Oscar's So White. This is before Obama. This is before we're embracing black hair, you know, like yeah. to be a dark skinned Caribbean black woman doing it. Mm-hmm. So they really worked to make sure that I went to private school, mm-hmm. <laughs> that I, you know, got into the best schools, that I had all the resources that I needed. And, and it wasn't that they were rich by any means, but they broke their back to make sure I had that. And so I would work my ass off to accomplish all these things. Mm -hmm. And what really got me is when Layla says, I'm wearing Gucci, but does that make me safer? And I say that because it's like, as much as you can signal, right? As much as I can signal with what I'm wearing, as much as I can signal with my degree or with my accomplishments, it still doesn't make me safe. Mm -hmm. I think Part of my drive to be somebody who's visible and known has been for safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has been this idea that, like, if I'm famous and I get pulled over, I might have a shot at making it home. Yes. The dark fuel that pushes me forward is like accomplish all this stuff Mm -hmm. and do all this stuff and make a name for yourself. So if something happens, you have a shot at making it home. And that's why I think this Layla episode was especially triggering because you're like, yeah, she is doing everything and there's no guarantee that she'll make it home. Yeah. And I feel myself tearing up when you said that, because when we go back to that question of freedom, can you ever really be free? And that is the big question that's worth exploring to me. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated you sharing this because I had a really like horrific encounter (sighs) with the police um, Mm. just uh, about a year ago. And that level of disempowerment and the way that they treated me and honestly could care less about anything of who I was, I Mm. felt, like you're saying, that there is nothing that can be done to really protect you. And I remember at one point I I was trying to call my mom and my husband as everything was going down, and I felt so trapped because I couldn't get them on the phone. Like Mm -hmm. the phone battery was dying, and I was like, I don't want to die here unwitnessed. 
but it's horrible, it's painful, and it brings a, a lens to the work that you do. And we can see that with Brooke. The resonance with Layla is potentially a key to such deep, meaningful work for them to engage with these questions that clearly you and I and then Brooke and Layla don't have answers to. <laughs> but the fact that you actually have the space and freedom to ask them yeah, 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 and to talk about them and to make space for them rather than shoving it down, putting it in that box right, that we've talked yeah, about yeah. and continuing to do and achieve as if you are only part of a person. Mm. Even the space to have this conversation with you, though painful, feels healing to be able to name it. Yes, it does. It does. I was also pulled over by the cops a year ago. It was probably the best case scenario. But when you said, I don't want to die here unwitnessed, Mm -hmm. I think that's part of what we're trying to express here with Layla and Dr. Brooke. Mm -hmm which is the stakes are high Mm -hmm. and it's always been high to the point where I don't want to die here unwitnessed is just part of every day. Mm -hmm. To some people, I'm sure hearing that, I I would assume a white person would go, what? (laughs) I would hope would be like, that's a wild statement. But for us, you're like, yeah, that's the reality. Mm -hmm. And it's a reality that you think about every single day at some point, whether consciously or unconsciously. Every time I get in the car, whether I acknowledge it or not, there is an awareness of the cops. Mm -hmm. There's an awareness of being pulled over. There's an awareness of where's my phone, where's my insurance card, like the ways in which I double check. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because when that moment finally happens, the powerlessness you feel, who you are, Dr. Janelle, and everything that you've accomplished and how much value you have around it and the idea that in these moments— that it doesn't matter Mm -mm. is so wildly unfair, you know? And that, I think, is what Layla's experiencing. You know, it's like, it's so wildly unfair how I could do everything correctly, how I could have all the money in the world, or I could, you know, come from a good home, or I could endure all the beatings, Mm -hmm. right? All the beatings that were supposed to teach me how to be protected. Mm -hmm. And yet, when the moment comes, I still am not safe. Yes. And then it makes perfect sense when she just wants to escape, right? She's like, of course. I'm going to escape into this fantasy that has nothing to do with everything that you've described for me of what my life will be. Let me just go into this fantasy that is so separate and protect it from it because this world has no place for me in it. Where's my phone? Layla, if you can just stay with me here. I know this is hard. Are you texting with Kara? How do you know? You want to share why you felt like you needed to reach out to her? You keep on telling me that the time we spend in here is for me. And right now I want to text my girlfriend. Is that okay with you? That's fine. So, Dr. Janelle, let's talk about the end of this conversation with Brooke and Layla, which didn't really feel like it had an ending. We saw that Layla retreated to her phone and Dr. Brooke went to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They had this really intense conversation and then kind of a shutdown happened. And then Layla left. What what do you make of of that? Yes, uh, this was was hard for me to watch because the pain was so evident in this. Mm. In therapeutic work and in my experience, one of the most important things that a therapist does is when you dive deep in, when you start to pull that up, is really being able to help the client close the loop on that and come to a space where they're able to leave with that reconstitution. It felt fragmented. Mm -hmm. What I'm assuming is that Dr. Brooks' distress got in the way of her really being able to create that cohesion and bring it back in. Well, that's time. Is there, like, something you should say? What do you mean? So I can go? You're free to go whenever you want, Layla. Well, thanks for today. You're welcome. See you next week. 
Ja. For me especially, and thinking about her as a, a young client, I was really worried about risk for Layla. I was worried about suicidality. Yes. I left really wishing that there was a chance for them to come back together because I think that that shows up for us a lot when we dive into something that feels really raw and can feel really vulnerable that we can then leave it fragmented because it gets to feel like too much it feels too big Mm. I think therapy serves a really important purpose one of the things is yes that it can be really big and we're going to stick with it and in it and I always think of the image of emotions as a wave sure like it comes at crest and then it gets to a point where it can recede. It feels more manageable. That isn't shutting down, but really being able to bring it back together. It's like we've talked a lot about the box, right? Like opening the box and the fear of opening Mm -hmm. the box and being able to put the box back on the shelf, right? Like, yes, that's what we were missing. Like they just opened the box and like left everything everywhere. Yes, (laughs) As opposed to, okay, just like, let's take it and put it gently back on the shelf and we can come back. You know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like that organization, that reorganization. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 So there was so much that came up for us with the Layla session, but I just want to say a couple things about the Brooke and Rita episode, which I was really struck by what I'll call the rational brain and the addiction brain, Mm -hmm. where we have seen Dr. Brooke be so rational and on point and very clear headed, if you will. And then there's this what I would just call the addiction brain. Mm -hmm. Here she is kind of bartering with Rita to let her drink and that we can uh, still be friends and that like this is okay and really using I think her skills as a therapist and her ability to manipulate a situation and kind of get somebody on her side. She's using that here with the addiction. Mm -hmm. And I found that so jarring. When we usually see addiction on TV, it's usually the bottom of the barrel. And this was so fascinating to see it in this gorgeous home Mm -hmm. with this professional, uh, with this gorgeous, well-dressed doctor Mm -hmm. using her skills as a doctor to rationalize her addiction. Oh, yes. That really does underscore that Addiction happens across different cultural class lines in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And it was great to see that represented and to see the conversation between a Black woman and the Latina woman really having that Mm -hmm. complicated, nuanced story. Mm. I I really do also want to call attention to what we saw with Brooke and Colin in the episode. Yes. I felt like we really got to see Brooke on her game as a therapist when it came to that third session flow with Colin and how they were really getting into the work with that pace, with her picking up on and making connections that pulled him to dig deeper, to be more real, to get behind some of the pretense that we've seen, some of this mask that we've seen with Colin. Mm -hmm. It was kind of cool to see. I felt like I was almost watching a sports game and I was like, nice move. (laughs) Dr. Brooke, I saw what you did there. Um, But Colin was not one step ahead of her this time. She was really pushing him, engaging him, intuiting in the situation, using her intuition. Yeah, she was not gentle with Mm -mm. him. (laughs) You know, she really went into the ring with him. Oh, yes. uh, Which was really exciting to, to see. Colin, what was that? We were having what I thought was a lovely session. Oh, sometimes I feel the need to push back on some of what you're telling me. You should resist that impulse. What, you don't like being tested? I don't like to punch down. So what stood out for me in Eladio's week was that reparenting moment with Dr. Brooke. Mm. And just kind of give a quick breakdown, Brandon. Reparenting is this therapeutic technique, particularly for folks who have had difficult or traumatic relationships with their parents where you actually use the therapist as a proxy, as this sort of stand-in to hopefully heal some of the painful moments that somebody experienced as a child. 
And it can be tricky and a little controversial. And we definitely saw that show up with Eladio this week. He wasn't having it. Yeah. So our time is almost up, but I wanted to make sure to leave y'all with some resources and readings and recommendations so you can continue some of these conversations that we started today. Please remember that this isn't a substitute for therapy. So if this episode brought up some emotions that you would like to process with a professional, definitely reach out and get that support that you need. First, I want to focus on a, a great reading to learn more about intersectionality. So for Kimberly Williams Crenshaw's article on mapping the margins, which looks at intersectionality, identity, politics, and violence against women of color, that is a great resource as well as her book on intersectionality called Intersectionality Essential Writings. Both awesome to check out. When we're thinking about that concept of double consciousness, of really thinking about your identity and majority white spaces or where you are in a marginalized group during the minority, another great read is W.E.B. Du Bois' Strivings of the Negro People, which looks at double consciousness. When we're thinking about spanking and abuse, there are a lot of wonderful resources. And one of the ones that I've been really drawn to lately is um, the social media account for Mr. Chaz on Instagram has some great resources and um, tools for parenting effectively, interacting with children and really digging into um, thinking about Black culture as it can show up in parenting relationships. The American Psychological Association also published a report on the intersections between racial trauma and parenting that's got some really juicy data to chew on as you're thinking about the intergenerational trauma and how it can show up in parenting as well. Finally, So much of this episode could have brought up feelings and emotions and maybe even some really difficult thoughts um, around your own mental health. So I want to encourage you to take care of yourself and make sure that you can use resources, for instance, like The Trevor Project, which is a wonderful crisis resource for LGBTQ youth um, that you can get crisis support, you can call, you can text. They have resources and referrals to affirming providers to be able to help you connect and get support. And then there's also the website Black Girls Smile, which has several resources for culturally affirming and supportive crisis intervention and mental health that's tailored to um, Black women and girls and femmes. So yeah, just keep taking care of yourself. And I hope that these readings, these resources are helpful. And you can find these and other recommendations on the In Treatment page on HBO's website. And it looks like that's our time for this week. Which is always so sad. But y'all, be sure to subscribe to In Session, the In Treatment podcast, so you don't miss us. And while you're doing that, why not give us a rating and review? It helps others find the show. In Session is the official companion podcast for the HBO show In Treatment and is a production of HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. Production music is courtesy of HBO, and you can watch new episodes of In Treatment on Sunday and Monday nights on HBO Max. Dr. Janelle, I'm going to see you next week. Same time? Oh, yes. You already know. (laughs) Take care. You too, hon.